Immigrant rights aside, what's the U.S. interest here, which would get us, connect us a little bit with the uh, political debate and talk about policy and get us back to our overarching theme about whether there's a different kind of conversation to be had around immigration. Uh, before doing that, we also had thought that Matt Iglesias from Slate might uh, follow up a little bit with John if there were questions from his presentation. We've sort of um, made the segue a little quicker than we'd intended, just in the interest of time. But I don't want to, uh, Matt. I don't want to take away from your time. If you if you had a any kind of reaction, this is Matt Iglesias again, um, Moneybox <laughs> columnist for Slate. Um, why don't I defer a couple of minutes to you to uh, engage John if you had any kind of follow up questions or thoughts emanating from the uh, from the presentation, and then I'll present our other panelists. And we can. Sure. Well, I, the, the main thing that occurred to me uh, looking at that, that presentation, which was fascinating, is that, you know, people in the, in the business world and, and economists often make a, a big distinction about immigrants of, of different skill levels, uh, you know, and the, and the different kind of implications of, of people with low levels of education versus higher levels coming in. And, and I was wondering if you know anything from survey data of, you know, do, do ordinary people see that distinction or, or find that there's some importance to it? You know, we, we haven't drilled into that specifically about the perception that Americans have. We did ask a question about four years ago about sort of attitudes toward immigrants generally. Do they make a positive impact on the economy? Um, attitudes were not very high on that particular item. Um, asked about attitudes toward crime. Um, they weren't great on that issue either. Um, one was definitely about culture. Americans are very high on the, the culture that immigrants bring to, to the United States. But you know, the interesting thing is when you dive in to see who is actually coming to America. You know, you look in China right now and you look into their data set, a very small percentage of people want to leave China permanently. It's about 6%. The same is true as India, with India. <laughs> but if you look into what, who that 6% is in those countries and you look in to see what their background looks like, those are the most educated people in the country. That's what that 6% is made up of. So if you think about the brain drain and the brain gain conversation that so many leaders in the world are having today, China and India are having serious issues just based on those data points alone. If you look in America, 10% of people want to leave the country permanently. But if you look at the educational background of those that would like to leave permanently, it's actually the opposite. So this is kind of a cruel joke, but if you could kind of shoot other deal, uh, leaders a deal and say any chance we could just kind of make a trade <laughs> for these folks, um, you know, then I think, uh, uh, I think that might be, a, you know, obviously a benefit in terms of that brain, brain gain, brain gain conversation uh, for the United States. And, and you know, I think a, a slightly related issue to that is, um, you know, you, you showed there's a, been a kind of polarization over time of opinion on this, where there's a growth in the number of people who say we should have more immigrants and also growth in the number of people who, who say we should have fewer. And do you know anything about the sort of the demographics underlying that? Uh, you know, what kinds of people are, are in those groups? Yeah, um, you know, if you, look, if you look at that trend, I mean, I think if you, if you think of kind of the political, I, I don't think anyone would be surprised about what the background is on that. But I think one of the most striking things is when you look at the background on race. So, I mean, I don't think it's surprising that Hispanics are among the top saying that, you know, there should be more immigration. Um, then it's white Americans that are kind of in the middle, but then it's black Americans that come between both of those two race groups. So I think that's probably the most, uh, most interesting find within that data set. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, let's segue into our next conversation, and I want to uh, be sure to introduce Simon Rosenberg, who is the uh, president and founder of NDN, and who has uh, worked the for quite some time on, on many of these issues. Um, and Tamar Jacoby, again, my uh, co-conspirator in, in, in helping to conceptualize today. Um, and for those of you who were not here earlier, she is the president of Immigration Works and also a fellow at the New America Foundation. Um, Simon, why don't we, we start off with you? I was asked earlier um, today by a reporter, uh, French TV, who was here, who asked me if Immigration, how large immigration is going to loom as an issue in, the gen, you know, in, the, in this election cycle once we get to the general election um, in the fall. And, and I admit I was a little bit stumped. Um, part <laughs> of me wanted to say it's, it's not going to be a big deal, and part of me was like it's going to be huge, and uh, 
What should, have, what should my answer have been? So he didn't ask about whether Mitt Romney speaks French? <laughs> Is that one? Um, that was a joke, everybody, sorry. Yes, you uh, could interview him in French, that's true. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think it will be an issue in the presidential election because it's an issue in the country. It's not, as we saw from the polling data, and this is very consistent with many other polls taken over a long period of time, is that you know, people view it, I, I call it a sort of a top tier, top of the second tier. I mean, the economy, national security issues, healthcare for a while were, were paramount in voters' minds, but this thing pops up around the same level as education you know, in national polls, you know, in the mid to upper single digits, I mean, uh, single digits depending on on the poll. So it's a top five, top six, top seven issue in the country. And in a presidential debate where things get aired out, I assume this is going to be aired out heavily in 2012, but also because of the states that will be in play. This is often, you know, in the congressional races, they're, because of the way the pop population distribution is in the United States, the issue of immigration is not as big an issue in the Senate and House races as it often is in the presidential race. And that's because of the 12 or 13 key states that will be contested in 2012. You know, four of them will be in the Southwest, Colorado, New Nevada, New Mexico, uh, and Arizona. Uh, and then even in states like Virginia and North Carolina, you're starting to see very large Latino populations that can end up being determinative in the outcome of the election. So, you know, six or seven of the 12, 13, 14 states that will be contested, this will be uh, an issue uh, a significant issue, so I think it will be a big issue. I think there are just two observations I have as we look ahead to 2012. Is one is that I, you know there has been a rough consensus um, among leaders of the two parties around the immigration issue since the 1980s. Right? It doesn't mean there hasn't been dissidents and people who didn't agree, but whether it was the Reagan Immigration Act of 1986 or the McCain-Kennedy plan that was you know cooked up. Recently, the two parties actually, this, is not, this was not historically a ter terribly polarizing issue. I mean, there was actually remarkable bipartisan consensus. What's true about 2012 is that Mitt Romney will be the first nominee of either party to be operating intellectually outside the consensus uh, in the modern era. And, you know, he's taken what are positions that are frankly surprising to me <laughs> on, this, on these sets of issues. And so you're going to have... Obama, who has run clearly as somebody who has wants immigration reform and DREAM Act and has been tough on the border, and we can get more into that if you want. And you're going to have Mitt Romney, who is far to the right of the Reagan, Bush, McCain sort of wing of the Republican Party and staked out, you know, a very virulently anti-immigrant path in this primary season. And so you're going to have a very different Republican Party uh, being um, seen by the American public on this issue without there being significant changes based on the polling data, right, of the way the public feels about this, right? So it's, it's a question of whether there's been a shift in the Republicans rather than the Democrats. The other thing I think it's important is what's interesting, again, about if you use the data that we just saw, was the continuity of the data, despite extraordinary economic changes that have gone on. And that's because this is not an issue that is actually deeply tied to the economy and to people's economic views. This is about race and about who we are and how we're changing as a country and this trajectory of us moving towards a majority minority country, you know, by 2040 or 2042. And I think that in many ways, this issue has been much more of a proxy about that social transformation than it's been a statement about uh, economic insecurity. Um, and certainly in the polling we've done, the polling you just demonstrated, there's just not a lot of evidence that where this is being fought out in the public, when politicians and groups speak about this, this is much more about, becomes a surrogate about the growing diversification of the country and us you know, going through the most profound demo demographic transformation that we've gone through since the arrival of the Europeans on this soil in the 15th and 16th century. And so I think in 2012, this would be heavily contested. And I think it's going to be fundamentally different than what we've seen in the last several elections because of the change in the Republican nominee's position vis-a-vis -vis the last few. John, on, on, this, on the issue of data and polling, I, I was curious when I saw the slide about, you know, uh, where people were asked to rank um, immigration as a problem, how, how big it loomed. Um, was, was the question framed as immigration, or um, if you frame the question, you know, how concerned are you about illegal immigration, does that spike the numbers? I mean, I imagine a lot of this is... It, it, it might. 
Uh, we, we didn't ask it. We just asked generally about uh, the satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the current state of immigration. So people could interpret that however they... Exactly. Uh -huh. And I think a lot of, the, again, the results, the way that they panned out, although that there was um, you know, a large majority of Americans actually saying that they did, uh, that they were dissatisfied with the current state, uh, the level of immigration. Again, you would think that that all kind of meant that they were some, at somehow against it, but there was still about 10% of Americans that were saying because they actually believe that it should be increased as opposed to decreased. But then again, of course, you have a majority of folks within that bucket that say that they do think it should be decreased. Right. Um, Matt, Simon is suggesting that at bottom, the discourse around immigration and people's feelings um, on the issue are driven by culture and identity and, and even race, and that this is sort of a, a cultural issue. Um, as if you put on your money box, money box hat <laughs> as an economics writer, um, are you willing to cede that, or do you find that this is still in many ways driven by economics and economic insecurity? Or is it hard to separate the two? Well, you know, I, I've always had the sense that, that a perception of economic impact is important to, to people's assessments of these things. But it is true that if you, if you look at research on the economic impact of immigrants, that, you know, what you typically find is that if there are people who suffer economically from high levels of immigration, it's recent immigrants themselves who have the most sort of direct labor market competition with other immigrants. And at the same time, if you look at the politics, if you look at the polling, it's clear that it's not recent immigrants from Mexico who are the driving force behind anti-immigration politics. Um, so it, it does seem that whatever people's uh, self-conscious articulation of it is, that you know, identity is really what's pushing people, and that you don't see a ton of really practical discussion of the economics. I mean, it's, um, it struck me many times that it's a little perverse to be living in a country where one big problem we have is that there's supposed to be um, a huge excess inventory of vacant homes, particularly in the southwestern United States, and then also a huge problem of uh, too many people wanting to move into the southwestern United States. You know, <laughs> um, th these are sort of, if you look at it on a purely practical economic level, there are some problems, but they're relatively easy to address. Uh, people, people have a political uh, you know, gridlock about it because it, it resonates on a more emotional, more cultural level. Tamar, what, you've been uh, in the trenches in the last, uh, well, I guess I should say decade, um, <laughs> uh, trying to um, uh, create consensus around the need for reform. Uh, bringing together disparate groups, businesses, uh, civil rights groups, and others, um, and you primarily from a center-right point of view, um, arguing against uh, the sustainability, the status quo. Um, that effort um, uh, hit a brick wall, uh, shall we say. And to what extent do you think, in, when you look back at that effort, and you're still engaged in it, and I don't want to be completely uh, uh, strike a hopeless note, I'm sure the next decade <laughs> will... Uh, Hopefully it will be different. But when you look back at the experience around um, the efforts, McCain-Kennedy, you know, and uh, particularly when you had a, a Republican White House that was uh, trying to lead this effort, and you look at that failure, um, what are some of the lessons that can be learned in terms of the way that the issues were framed and the, term, the terminology and the sort of discourse that was used and, and how should we kind of, uh, or you in particular, uh, you know, hit, hit a reset button in terms of the way that this is the pitch, so to speak. Yeah, really good question. Um, I mean, I go to, to John's very interesting polling, right? What we saw was that 64% of the public, two thirds of the public, is basically for the kind of reform we were pushing for. So, and 20, only 20% Wanna, which is the kind of reform we were pushing for, allowing people to become, stay and become citizens. Only 20% want to deport everyone. So how did the 20%, you know, one way of asking is how did the 20% win? Um, one way I think is that in American politics, as we all know, it's a, a, a small minority that's very engaged on something and very emotional and very dedicated can often stop something that a majority is okay with if that small minority is very intent on it. And I think that's part of what we saw. I think there's, it's, the other part of it, though, is that the, even that 60% is, has very mixed feelings. They, as you, uh, the Gallup data is, 
shows them to be very favorable, thinking that immigrants are better, are good for the country more than they're bad for the country. Other polls show that a little more mixed, that if you ask, is immigration more of a problem or an opportunity, people say problem. And um, they are, in fact, much more favorable to skilled immigrants than to unskilled immigrants, much, 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 much more favorable to legal immigrants than illegal immigrants. So the question is, okay, we've got that two-thirds saying we're for fixing it. We think it's a problem, we're for fixing it, and we think the solution is citizenship. But how do you get them kind of over their unease, over their volatility, and to have it be enough of a problem that they think the government really should solve it now? And to me, the answer to that is to connect it more, to highlight the link to our competitiveness. And this goes back to the, to the other point that your polling shows very clearly, 80% of the people think economy is a big issue. <laughs> Everybody's worried about the Chinese beating us. Everybody wants to do everything we can possibly do to be winning on that score. Only 4% you know, think immigration is a big problem. The good news is immigration is actually linked to our competitiveness, as we saw this morning. I mean, it's certainly linked to our competitiveness in terms of getting the people who are the best and brightest knowledge workers to America. That's going to be key to our future. And indeed, a large part of our workforce already here whether or not they get the best education and fulfill themselves as the best they possibly can is related to our policy. So to me, reframing in terms of our competitiveness, our economic interests, what this is gonna mean for America, as opposed to arguing it out on terms of race or hearts and minds or what have you, that is the reset button. To be fair, I, I suppose one could, could look, drill down on those polling numbers and ascertain whether, uh, if my top concern <clears throat> is jobs, uh, you know, maybe I'm, pre I'm, I'm baking into that concern uh, a feeling that there are fewer jobs to go around because of immigration. So I, I think we, we shouldn't be so quick to, to uh, say, oh, immigration is totally not a big problem, biggish problem because only 4% of the people being polled identify as the number one problem. If when you're identifying jobs is the biggest problem, you think part of the problem is, is illegal immigration. And I don't know if there's a way to sort of separate that out. Um, well, we've pulled, we've pulled on that. Okay. And, and, you know, we've asked people, do you think illegal immigrants are taking away your job? And the answer is no, actually. And, the, and that's, you know, overwhelmingly, even in battleground states, even in the Southwest, there is a perception that undocumented immigrants are doing jobs that I wouldn't do that are beneath me and my social status and beneath my friends. And to a great degree, by the way, that's actually true, right? And, big, and so there isn't, this is why I think the, I mean, I'm, I don't want to be a uh, contrarian on this, but I, I think the, the, you know, where the battle has been up to this point, and this is why what as she's saying is so important, and her saying is so important, mm -hmm. is that up to this point, this debate has really been about race and about culture and about the way we're changing. And the question is, is there a way? So for example, I mean, it's also how, been about rights and sort of what's uh, morally correct to do for, you know, if you look at the DREAM Act for this yeah. one child or, you know, a lot, I think there's been a lot of spillover from the civil rights movement in terms of, of the rights-based discussion, which yeah. um, gets us, is a different pathway to discuss immigration than sort of a, a sheer, you know, economic, you know, competitiveness discussion. Um, and I know you've, you've uh, done some writing on that. So just, <laughs> I'm, I'm pitching you a softball. <laughs> I, I, well, what I will just quick comment on is that the, I do think that one of the most, in, I, I often talk about, I've been working in national politics for 20 years and worked on a wide range of issues. And I've never worked in a debate where people were so willing to believe things that were not true uh, as I have in the immigration debate. And so even if you just take this basic Thing that's happened in the last 12 to 18 months. I mean, we know that the Obama administration has made the immigration system better and the border safer, and trade with Mexico has exploded while there has been increased violence on the Mexican side of the border. I'm willing to bet that we could, if we polled on that, that the knowledge of the fact that the, the border cities are the safest cities in America today, that the crime rates along the border region have plummeted, that there's now actually no net legal migration into the United States. So on the question that you had there about people not wanting, there is no legal 
illegal migration into the United States anymore, right? That the system is actually moving towards the ultimate place that we wanted it, I think, back when we began. You know, it's happening through roundabout means, right? It's not how we would have gotten there, right? I think in this whole thing. But the system is actually, one of the things that's happened in the last six years is that we've learned that we can actually make the immigration system better and that we can make the border safer. This is incredibly important to take to the American people because a lot of the doubt is whether or not government has the power to deal with these vast flows. I think we're making the, the system better. Yeah. What, what exactly do you mean? You mean the crackdown on the workforce and you know, well, employers? Absent, absent CIR, if I can speak in shorthand, right? Absent of comprehensive immigration reform right. passing, which I think was the thing we all wanted. You know, the, the steps the administration's taken over the last 12 to 18 months, right? Including the most recent ones in the last few weeks have tweaked the system on the margins. I'm not gonna argue there's been wholesale substantial change, but there are 500,000 families who are gonna be significantly, benefit, who are gonna benefit significantly from the most recent change in the last few weeks. And so the, the thrust is to continue to make the system better and the border safer. I think the, I, I think the point I'm making here is that what is not, when you look at the data on this and the discussion, it's all about negative stuff. Right. It's all about hordes of undocumented immigrants flooding the country. It's about drug violence. It's about taking jobs away. There's actually an incredibly positive story to be told about an administration with greater resources, greater cooperation with our Mexican partner, better strategy, has actually made the immigration system substantially better and the, and the border safer. And I think that that's a message we have to take, those of us who want to see a better immigration system have to take to the public, because it shows that it's possible, that it's not impossible. And I think that's going to be an important part of our narrative going forward. You know, when you, when you said that your polling shows that people don't feel that undocumented workers are taking their jobs, I would just dissent, because up until today I felt like I should be a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins, <laughs> and, and now I know why, why I'm not, you know, these <laughs> undocumented workers like Dr. Q <laughs> took my job. And, um, tomorrow you had. Um, so the thing, two things we haven't talked about, I spend a lot of time sitting behind a two-way mirror or one-way mirror, I guess it is, um, watching focus groups. I sometimes joke it's the most fun way to spend an evening. It tells you something about my social life. <laughs> but um, when you sit in focus groups listening to people to talk about immigration, they don't talk about too much about culture. They don't talk about identity. And maybe they're masking that. What they talk about is welfare right. and control. Yeah, it's control. The two, and it's, so control is, is what you're speaking about. We're getting control. That's how it's getting better. We are getting control. The question is, what do you do else once you get control? Control is not enough, because we've got 11 million people living here, and we still need bunch of PhDs and high-tech IT people and scientists and ag workers and guess what, restaurant workers too. So control, that, so I think I totally agree that we have to make the case that we've gotten better control and we can have control. Um, I don't understand why people think they get welfare because they don't. But again, people, um, I mean, I, I, the, the, I mean, I guess maybe just one thing to say about the, the race thing is sort of interesting to watch because in a focus group, everybody's complaining about, you know, the people in the, in the emergency room and the too much Spanish and everybody's complaining about it. But in every focus group, there's one or two people who are complaining with a kind of shrillness in their voice that everyone else in the room hears is a little too shrill <laughs> and you can almost see them moving their chairs away. Right. Like, I don't want to sound like that. So the race thing is complicated. I mean, it is undoubtedly about culture and identity, but people also, Americans truly, I think, don't want to be racist. Well, we elected a, a black president with 53% of the vote. It's the largest margin a Democrat has gotten since the 1960s, right? So the country has passed into some new place on race. The thing is that I think, to go back to something you said earlier, is that this hasn't been well digested yet. I mean, we've had the rise of the non-black white America, right, with rising Asian population, rising Latino population, is only a post-1965 uh, experience. It's very recent in our past. It's happened with incredible rapidity and great volume. And we haven't really digested it yet as a country. I mean, and uh, in, in so many ways, and even, I was hoping last night in the Republican debate to listen to Juan Williams ask, how do you all feel about us becoming a majority minority country, you know, that you're gonna be living in? That would have been an awesome question. Well, I think, in the, it's in interesting. The I'm gonna turn to you, Matt, in one second. Uh, you know, we elected a black president and yet 
the the sort of narrative that he is somehow a little too foreign has has persisted among a not insignificant part of the of the republic you know the of the opposition and maybe they, they they're the opposition they have to seize on something but and and that's really tied into i mean it's a question of identity and it's almost as foreign as more than his race or maybe it's hard to separate the two um so i wonder if uh you know Mitt Romney, if he's the nominee, is going to continue to, to pound sort of immigration as a cultural issue. Sometimes I feel like he's comp overcompensating on that to sort of, you know, provide, you know, show his bona fides with conservatives because there's so many other subject matters where he's compromised. Um, but Matt, what's your sense of how significant immigration would loom in a Romney, Obama, uh, slate sponsored presidential debate. <laughs> but you know, you, it would be interesting because, as, as Simon was saying, it's actually been a long time since we've had presidential candidates with big disagreement on immigration. That you had um, when when McCain and Obama ran against each other, they talked about it, but they were actually operating from within a, a very similar kind of dynamic. Um, Romney, you know, has really stepped outside that kind of bipartisan consensus. Um, Obama, at the same time, has actually. I mean, Simon was was phrasing this as a good thing, but has in a lot of ways governed toward the right, uh, you know, in a practical sense, since there hasn't been a, a real legislative opportunity for reform. So it's it's difficult to know how it'll play out, although it's it's clear that Romney, you know, beyond immigration in particular, is sort of really emphasizing Americanness, you know, in, in a very hardcore way as, as one of his key themes, tying together everything he's saying. Um, and it's it's difficult to to know you know exactly what that amounts to, but there does seem to be a an effort to claim that in his foreign policy, in his domestic policy, and perhaps in his attitude toward immigrants and immigration, that that Obama is like is not a real American or doesn't really have America's uh, interests at heart. And that's a you know that's a potent charge. I mean, the, the United States is a more nationalistic society than most of the other kind of peer developed country. But where is the, the policy divide going to come down to? I mean, on the one hand, and, and actually just to step back a little bit, we, we, we talk about how certainly compared to recent decades, you know, we have um, two potential, you know, we're, we're sort of already nominating uh, Romney here today, but let's assume it's him. <laughs> um, we have two candidates that are, are further apart than uh, candidates we can think of from each party in recent decades. But there certainly have been periods of time in American history where you might have had a candidate who felt that we should completely shut down the country to legal immigration. And I think we should just, you know, at least acknowledge the fact that even in this environment, um, you know, Mitt Romney and the economy where it is and everything, Mitt Romney is, is very quick to always say he's a big fan of legal immigration. And there were plenty of times in American history where they could, there could have been an argument even about that. But so given where we are and, and the sort of the fact that a lot of people in Washington, uh, Tamar accepted, and, and a few others here, <laughs> have kind of given up on immigration as a federal issue, and it's sort of been punted to the states. Where do you think the actual concrete, specific arguments w would occur in that campaign, or is it all going to be on these sort of vaguer questions of identity? And I, I mean, I think as we were saying, I mean, there's not a huge number of there's not a huge public outcry for, for specific addressing of the immigration issue in concrete terms. So I think it may stay uh, rather vague, um, which doesn't mean there's no difference in policy. I mean, we've seen that the, the leaders of the executive branch have a lot of discretion over how exactly immigration uh, laws are enforced, over you know, what you do with the system, so on and so forth. And uh, it's, it's clearly it's important to the Obama administration to uh, attempt to be showing that they are making the system more humane uh, you know, insofar as they can. And it's also important to them to, to show a sort of defensiveness that they are securing the border. Uh, a Romney administration has some different incentives around that. Um, but, you know, I, it's difficult for me to imagine people getting really deep into the weeds about it. But I think we're leaving out the one phrase we haven't uttered is the Latino vote, right? right. The Latino vote is going to be critical, is the largest, fastest growing voting bloc in the country and critical in se several of the states that are going to be hotly contested. So, you know, I think because of the way the two parties split up, Romney, uh, Romney wants to talk about immigration now because he thinks it appeals to the 20% who want to deport them, who are only 20% of the country, but a big percentage of Republican primary voters, he's going to want to stop. And the people who are most skeptical of him. 
and and he's going but he's going to want to stop talking about it as soon you know next week or whenever it is that he clinches the nomination whereas Obama's going to want to talk about it because he thinks he can win Latino votes so Romney has had a stake in talking about it up to now that stake is going to end whereas Obama's is going to grow in a big way so i think to the degree it gets injected it's going to be mostly i hope Romney's going to say i don't want to talk about it and it's it. also true that a lot of um, latino organizations um, that supported um, Obama and, and worked hard for him, they, they feel they might, there's disappointment um, to some extent in that community, and there's arguments about how much and who's disappointed more, um, about the extent to which the administration pushed for, the, you know, for re revisiting comprehensive immigration reform. Um, some attempts were made, but obviously in this climate it was only going to go so far. Um, so Simon, uh, if the president called you tomorrow and said, <laughs> I really got to get this back on the front burner here because I, I owe these um, these groups uh, after all the support they gave me, and I want to re-energize the Latino vote. Uh, but how should I talk about it this time? How can I succeed where Tamar failed? I'm going to blame Tamar <laughs> exclusively for no, no, I, a few I years I, back. I, how I do we kind of significantly to the failure too? I think. Um, I, I, look, I think I think two things. One is I don't think it's it's interesting that Tamar the way you're saying it is that I don't know that. Either candidate will have an incentive to make it a front burner issue in the fall because of the data that we saw earlier, which is it just isn't a top tier issue. And every time the Republicans have tried to make it a top tier issue, it's failed for them because there are just other issues that voters care about more. And and that's and keeping that in perspective, you got to show up on it, you got to lean into it, you got to have a position, but you can't expect it to produce beyond what it's capable of producing. There are two groups of voters in the country that this really matters to, that it's a voting issue for, right? Right-wing conservatives, 15, 20% of the country, who are very loud, very organized, very vocal through right-wing talk radio and other means, as you showed in your numbers, and then Latinos. And as I said earlier, the Latino vote is disproportionately important in the presidential race. And what we know today about the Latino vote going into 2012 is that you know, the Republicans' escalation of rhetoric and policy in recent years, SB 1070, you know, uh, and what's happened in, in other states, and the vote after vote after vote that's taken place in Congress recently has had an impact on the Republican brand in the Latino community. And what you see in the data today is that three separate polls taken the last six weeks all had ex almost exactly the same numbers, which had Obama up in the high 60s, which is where he was in 2008, and Romney down in the low 20s, which is seven, eight, nine points below where McCain's numbers were in 2000. I'm sorry, seven points below? Seven, eight points below where McCain, where McCain was. So if the, data, if the data on this quickly is that, and I'll start with 2000, right? It was um, 65, 35, um, uh, Gore, Bush. In 2004, is 59, 40, Kerry, uh, Bush, with Bush doubling his market share with the Republican Party's market share with Latinos in just two elections. 2008, it went to 67, 31, Obama, um, Obama, uh, McCain. And so the thing is right now where we start today with Obama being below where he was in national numbers last time, he's exactly where he was with Latinos four years ago. And the Republicans have dropped you know, up to you know, high single digits. But by the way, that's the way it should be. I mean, the thing is those numbers I think are consistent with what the Republican party has actually done in, in recent years. The challenge for them is how do they get out of this hole that they're in in 2012 when their nominee is going to be the most virulently anti-immigrant nominee that we've had in national politics in the last 30 years. And there is no running mate other than Jeb Bush who could put, you know, solve on those, <laughs> put, you know, help make the bridge to the Latino community because I don't think Rubio can actually do it and I'm happy to talk about that more. And so they've, they're going into this election with a much bigger problem with Latinos than they've ever had. Uh, and no obvious way to solve it, I, I would say, in the election, which means that the South, you know, the, the path that Romney took to win the nomination, and I agree with you, he used this immigration issue as a bridge to the conservatives who were very suspicious of him. And by the way, it worked really well because it hurt Gingrich and Perry. In right. A very well, significant that's been the other way. half of what's interesting is the yeah. nuance that's emerged even in the, among the Republican candidates. Right. Yeah. Look, we have to recognize that Mitt Romney, if you look at what he did to McCain in the primaries in 2007, where he spent millions and millions of dollars attacking McCain for being a liberal in immigration, and then he did it this time. There's no candidate in either party of the modern era 
that has vested more money and more of his brand in being anti-immigrant politician than Mitt Romney. And so the ability for him, of, of who got to this level of politics, other than Marshall Tom Dan. Tancredo, right? <laughs> Tom Tancredo never broke 1%. So he's got, I mean, he had to do what he had to do. I mean, I've worked in presidential elections. I understand the game. But there's going to be a price at the other end, and it's going to be hard for them, I think, to get back. And again. a lot of his families in Chihuahua. I want to just ask John if um, you're familiar with um, polling data uh, that among uh, Latinos and their perspective on you know, the, how much they prioritize immigration, how that might compare with how the, their concern for jobs and the economy. Because as Simon mentioned, um, you know, we, we always sort of uh, stipulate that this is uh, a matter of huge concern for Latinos. And, and anecdotally, it seems true. And, um, but are you, have you guys done studies on that question among? Yeah, we have a little bit. I mean, I, I think the obvious answer is that it is a priority. But, it, you know, at the same token, it's a priority for all Americans. It's just how it's individually addressed and, and, and what's, what's of their interest. But again, I go, I go back to our initial slide and, and what's the impact that immigration is going to have on, these, on this election uh, coming down the pike. It, it could have a big impact. It all turns on what's going to happen with the economy. Again, we see unemployment at 8.3%. Um, Q4 on GDP isn't out yet, but um, you know we grew at 1.3%. A lot of the modeling and analyses that, have, that are being done on trying to predict the outcome of this election, everything that, that we're kind of seeing, it just turns right back to the economy. It's just the number one thing, and I think it doesn't matter about really your, your demographic background, um, your race, your age. I think the number one thing that Americans are focused on in this election is just going to be the economy. Because even foreign policy barely registers now <laughs> on those, right? But, you know, I should say one other thing. <clears throat> this, this is just kind of an aside, but, you know, Dr. Gallup, our founder, he, he said um, uh, something about how, you know, with democracy being the will of the people. But if it is about the will of the people, somebody has to go out and figure out what that will is. You know, it's funny because we get... We get slammed a lot by politicians in town because they say, you know, politicians say, I'm not going to do what the Gallup poll says. They always say Gallup, it might not even be our survey. Um, I'm not going to do what the polls say. Uh, I'm going to do what's right. But, you know, Gallup has never, never been anywhere where we've said, do exactly what the polls say. And really what we're saying is, is that leaders just need to be informed to what it is that the people are actually thinking. So whether it is Hispanics about immigrations and that kind of thing, um, you know, leaders need to be uh, uh, aware of exactly what it is that they're thinking. And again, that's what's on top of the minds of, of Americans right now. Number one thing, it's just the economy. Um, Matt, so how do we ascertain what's in the, in the national interest? Um, if a lot of the debates in the past have been about what's fair um, and what should we do for these um, Dream Act kids um, and the sort of morality and civil rights, you know, discourse, if we could sort of magically set that aside, whether that's the right or wrong thing to do, mm -hmm. um, and you just had a cold-blooded framing of what should the U.S. and its national interests do, and the kind of language that a, a good red-blooded Mitt Romney voter could sure. understand, <laughs> how would you even begin to sort of formulate that? Well, you know, I mean, I do think that it's clear that, that people have a, a greater, I think, friendliness toward, toward the, the higher skill immigrant bracket. And that, you know, if, if I was talking about this politically, I would try to lead with that and with the idea that a strength of the United States, you know, not just currently, but throughout history has been that a lot of the, the hardest working, most talented, most ambitious people from all around the world have wanted to come here. And we've benefited from that in every major war we've fought. It, we've benefited from it in peacetime, that a huge number of the founders of our high tech companies in Silicon Valley are, are immigrants. But I do think that that extends to the dream issues and, and to other kinds of things that, you know, if you have people who are in this country and whose aspiration is to get an education, that it's more valuable to all of us uh, to have them do it. And, you know, even Rick Perry was essentially taking that theme. Uh, I don't think it's working for him. You know, his campaign has a lot of problems. But, <laughs> you know, e even inside a Republican Party primary, I mean, I think he was right to think that there's, you know, a real logic to that position, that people are not going to say that it's somehow better for, for native-born people to have immigrants uh, not going to school, not getting jobs, not having the opportunity to, to do this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, to the extent that, that people, people do seem to have a, a lot of concerns about 
uh, use of welfare and other sort of public service type things. Uh, it, it's difficult to know how much uh, actual information uh, changes people's concerns about that kind of thing, but I think it should be it should be possible in your rhetoric to talk about you know people coming here and and having the opportunity to work and to pay taxes and things like that, you know, as the exact reverse, and to be very very open to the idea that of course you know you don't want people to come here just to sort of cash uh, welfare checks or something like that, but that the main reason people want to come to America is because it's a good place to live and work and get a job, and that it's good for America if people who want to work here are able to come here and contribute. I was thinking about um, what, what Simon was talking about, the paramount importance of, of con control, and that being the anxiety that's at the heart of a lot of uh, this for some folks. And, uh, and Rick Perry, um, yesterday, you know, when he's pressed in South Carolina about in-state tuition in Texas, um, you know, he, there's a sort of two-minute prelude to before he gets to the answer where he has to talk about the thousands of people he deployed on the border and the, uh, you know, the, the craft that he put on the river and he practically brags about shooting people and it's just this huge almost militaristic surge before he starts to get to the point about, but then it's this kind of very reasoned, uh, do you want these people to be taxpayers or tax users? And, uh, and again, it's, you know, the fact that we've had Rick Perry and um, Gingrich speak, you know, within the contours of a Republican primary um, about reality in many ways and the sort of, um, uh, you know, the fact that it's not realistic to deport 12 million people. It's, it's just, it's, maybe that's a, a heartening uh, milestone, despite the fact that, you know, Romney's compensating on the other extreme. Come on. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was trying to get in a minute ago. I mean, it's true. I'm, I deplore Romney's rhetoric as much as you do. But I think what we, what we are seeing is in some ways a different Republican Party. I mean, both Perry's campaign did, um, you know, lose significant ground after he made his remarks about unauthorized immigrants, but he was losing ground for other reasons. Right. Gingrich made his remarks. There were remarks. three reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Gingrich, <laughs> yeah. Gingrich made his remarks about unauthorized immigrants, and he gained 10% of the polls. And it wasn't because of his remarks about unauthorized immigrants. And it was interesting, the morning after people assumed he had really he hurt himself. He dead because right. of it. And he wasn't dead because of it at all. And so, you know, I think we are seeing, even in Republican primary bases, more room for an open view of that. You know, I think what, I mean, if, you know, if you ask me what would my advice be to Republican candidates, sort of what would, you know, as what would, right. what would um, his advice be to Democratic candidates, you know, I can see that no Republic, it's unlikely that Romney's gonna come back and say, you know, legalize everyone. He can't flip flop that much. But he certainly could start with the way he talks now, emphasizing the party usually leaves for last. Legal immigrants are good for the country. High skilled immigrants are good for the country. Um, you know, I think Latino voters do care. Reagan used to say Latino voters are really Republicans. They just don't know it. The problem is they can't hear the Republican message because they hear the anti-immigrant rhetoric. And so the question is, how do Republicans put that anti-immigrant rhetoric aside so that they can get their message across? I don't know if Romney can do it anymore, but I think other Republicans do still do. Do you think under can. a Romney administration, uh, the business community takes the lead in, in altering the, the tenor of discourse and educating the administration on sort of the need to... Well, you see, congressional Republicans will also, I mean, we, even as the campaign is, you know, on the campaign trail, Republicans, some Republicans are sounding, you know, off the chart, congressional Republicans are moving to fix the illegal immigration system. There have been a lot of bills introduced in the last several months, giving visas here and visas there and trying to fix the legal system. So maybe in a new administration, what we do is we fix the legal immigration system first, and then we, and we do the enforcement, and we allow everyone to make the speech that Perry said, which works, by the way. When you say, I've controlled this, I've controlled this, we've got it under control, we're fixing the legal immigration system, and then maybe down the road, we get to the harder question of the unauthorized. And I, I think it's worth, worth emphasizing in terms of control, trying to emphasize the idea that, you know, if you create legitimate pathways for legitimate activity that it becomes much easier to isolate and weed out, you know, drug smugglers or human traffickers or, or whatever else it is you're doing. Uh, you know, I think most people 
one of the reasons why the, the legal illegal distinction cuts so much weight with voters is I think most voters don't understand right. how difficult it is right. to immigrate legally. Right. Why don't they they don't have, have this idea in their head that there's people who, you know, they just didn't want to like stand on some line, so they snuck across, or maybe they're criminals. And, and you know, I mean, we know that's not true, but it has to be conveyed that, you know, if you create a process that's simple, that meets people who want jobs with people who want workers, that then you won't have so many people People trying to evade the system. Let's take a, a few questions from the audience. If you could um, wait for the microphone and identify yourself, um, we, have, we have some time for questions. Hi, uh, I'm Dara Lind with America's Voice. Uh, so we have, on the one hand, everyone saying we need to take this to the American people, we need to make the case to the American people. On the other hand, we have what looks like a pretty durable polling set over 40 years, which not only features a lot of economic change, but also some pretty significant changes in immigration policy over that time. And then Simon saying that people are more willing to believe wrong things about immigration <laughs> than they are about anything else, not to mention, you know, tomorrow, the immigrants taking welfare thing that you were talking about in your focus group, that, you know, that's a 15-year-old policy that hasn't percolated through yet. So when we talk about taking the case of the American people, like, what's going to change? What's going to break? now? Again, I think it has to be how we've got it. We, we haven't been arguing it in a way that's been getting through or making it enough of a priority for people. And I actually do think, I think it, the case is about we have gotten control. Um, it is about creating legitimate ways for it to work. And I think in a big way, it's about what the first panel was about. I mean, in a number no one threw out, in 2010, 8% of the kids born in America had an unauthorized parent. That's almost 10% of the workforce of tomorrow. And all those bad things we saw, you know, it's about it's the, the years of behind in schooling, the not going to graduating from high school, the not getting to college. I can't believe we can't make people see that that's an issue for our competitiveness. Um, if people, you know, if 10% if of Americans aren't graduating from high school and they could if we helped them, I can't believe that that, that won't matter to people <laughs> and be useful. Other questions? <laughs> I was surprised that um, the other day uh, going to the local uh, pharmacy and seeing that this, the um, machines are all bilingual now. We get to choose our, our uh, language. So I would assume that there would be more Hispanic or Latino um, candidates right now that really be, be pressing these issues more aggressively, if not this time around, definitely within four years. The issue of immigration writ large. Yeah, Simon, do you there have are, any? There are, um, every year there are more Latinos running for major office. I mean, there could be you know, three or four Senate candidates this cycle of Latino descent. We know that the, um, you know, that we know that all the governors, the Republicans had tremendous success in 2010 in electing, you know, prominent Latinos. And so I, I think it's a demographic, I mean, demographic, demography is not destiny. However, it's important. And the rising population, but again, the huge increase in Latino population is a very recent event in our history. And it's going to take a while for it to cycle down to things like candidates running for city council and then bumping up to state rep and then, you know, running up for higher office. But you're beginning to see it. You look, Mitt Romney, right? His family's from Mexico. We just, uh, you know, we even have a presidential candidate. So I think it's just, uh, it's inevitable that you're going to see more of that. And, and I, I just want to make just one on the question before. The thing that's also forcing the debate is what's happening in the states, where the states are taking action because of the lack of federal progress. Um, and in many cases are taking action that is, you know, not uh, positive uh, in the way that it's, you know, in, in trying to solve the problem and, and trying to fix the broken system. And so that's the point, I think, is that this is a real issue. The system is broken. It's anachronistic. It fits. It doesn't fit our values or our economy of the 21st century. We need a better immigration system. And until that happens, I think this will be, you know, a major issue in front of the, the American people. And, and just because we're going to end soon, I throw out one other idea to you all to cogitate around is that I think also for those of us who want to see this through, we're going to have to help rehabilitate the image of Mexico in the United States. And I, and I think that 
the portrayal that one sees of Mexico as sort of a failed state of a narco-terrorist, a new word that's been introduced by the Republicans in Congress this year, which is a remarkable conflation of all the evil things in the world that has no bearing on reality whatsoever, right, is the, this issue about what has happened with Mexico and it's the centrality of our relationship with Mexico going forward. And I'll just do this very quickly, right? I mean, 10% of our population now in the United States is of Mexican descent. Um, we are, Mexico is now our third largest trading partner, our second largest export market. Um, Univision is the fourth largest network, television network in the United States, now supplanting one of the traditional networks, right? You can go through the list of things about how you know, we are increasingly ha are going to have an identity as a Latin nation. How we resolve this issue of what the role of Mexico is and this enormous, you know, as I believe that Arturo Saracan, the ambassador from Mexico to the U.S., is correct, it's arguably our most important bilateral relationship in the world. And we treat Mexico and Mexicans as very distant from our collective imagination. And I think that part of the success of winning this debate over time is to be honest and true about what Mexico is to us, right? It's, it, we trade more with Mexico today than we do with Germany, the UK, and Japan combined, almost as much we do with China. The centrality of the economic relationship is in terms of recasting the economic piece, I think, as opposed to it being about a failed state, but this place that our economic destiny and our cultural destiny is so tied up into, right? Is something that is is something we've got to figure out how to talk about because we've got to turn Mexico into an asset and not a liability in this in this conversation because Mexico is an asset and not a liability of the United States and it's one of the areas that I think we've got to confront you know head on as we go forward and that's part of the advice I'd give to President. I think that's Obama. a that's a as somebody who grew up in Mexico in the same state that Mitt Romney's family is from. Uh, I, I, I applaud that. That's that's a, it's very true, and it's it's one of my frustrations is how Mexico is portrayed. Uh, you had an earlier question though that we were going to return to on 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 the sort of linkage between immigration and security. And John, can you talk a little bit about that? And and even beyond the linkage, just the, the fact that this campaign is happening in a time when uh, we've alluded to this, but when it, when Americans don't seem overwhelmingly concerned by the issue of terrorism and, and national security that dominated the, the last couple of election cycles. Do you want to flesh that out a little bit? Sure. Um, yes, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, when we asked people about, um, and this was again a survey from four years ago, but we asked about the impact that they think immigrants to the United States have on things like crime um, or the economy, et cetera. Um, again, you're asking about terrorism, but also safety in general. You know, one of the things is the attitudes aren't great toward the perception that immigrants have toward crime. That, that needs to, I, I would think that if one's working in that direction, that would need to get fixed. The other thing is we've seen spikes at times when there's incidents like 9-11, where people say that immigration needs to get decreased um, substantially. So, you know, if, if you think about it, somebody had made a comment about how does this get addressed and what, would, what kind of recommendations would you have? for politicians right now. You know, Americans, the way they see things is two very different ways. One is a national picture, and one is something for themselves. It's something that all pollsters will tell you, all survey experts will tell you, that, you know, if you ask about public schools, they say that the public schools in the country are a mess, but then everyone says that they like their public school. Or how about Congress? Everybody says that the approval ratings of Congress are a mess, yet you say, how do you feel about your own Congress uh, man or woman? And they say that, well, I actually have a pretty good feeling about that. Do you see what I mean? And you also hear about the survey data that, that reflects and say, do you think immigration um, is a threat to your own job? Well, no, I don't, but I think it might have some issues um, at, the, at the national level. So the thing is, is if you had to make a recommendation on those two things, whether it's, you know, if you're trying to make an impact on security and that kind of thing, there has to be an appropriate communication strategy at the national level on, you know, getting to Americans about what is happening for the country but also how does it impact the individuals for themselves and really trying to bridge the gap on, on, on those two issues. And it would probably also be safe to say that one of the legacies of the period after 9-11 is this notion of sequencing and the question of even today, the, the sort of paramount need to assert control and to show that you control the border before you can get on to the other subjects. And there was that, in, that slide that you showed about, you know, when people are asked the priority about undocumented, number one is, uh, you know, enforce at the border, and number two is uh, then deal with um, the people who are already here, which I think does reflect perhaps still that lingering concern with, with uh, 
uh, security. Right, and if I may, there was another question really about Hispanic candidates, whether they're running for governor maybe one day for the presidency. You know, this is a sensitive topic, talking about things like religion, race, and American politics, but actually about the candidate specifically. You know, about uh, 50 years ago, Dr. Gallup was just act openly asking Americans if your party had a well-qualified candidate uh, running for president that happened to be black, would you vote for that candidate? Majority of Americans, or, you know, about 45% or something, said no, openly to pollsters. Now, the trend on that is, is really fascinating because it's, 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 it just perfectly increases. Right now, it's at about 94 to 96% that said that they would vote for a well-qualified person that happened candidate that happened to be black if, it, if they ran in their party. We've asked that for a woman. We've asked that about various religions. Obviously, Joe Lieberman, who's Jewish, we've asked it about that. We've also asked it if you would vote for a Mormon candidate. If you were to ask Gallup right now, if I had to just go out of a limb and guess, I don't think that that would be something that if you rotated in, that a bunch of Americans would say, no, I have, I have a problem with that. I wouldn't vote for a Hispanic candidate. It's, it's really more um, things that candidates have, things like um, being married three times, that really is, that has a, that has a serious impact <laughs> on, strikes on, your on, voters, <laughs> on voters. You know, the same thing about being old, even though Reagan was elected. But if you just ask Americans, would you vote for an old candidate? Um, they're, they're, uh, they're a little bit less likely to. Uh, being a Mormon and being Jewish is significant, not significantly, but it's lower than being a woman or being black. So again, if you had to ask, if, if I just had to guess, I'm, I'm going out on a limb a little bit, Gallup, you know, we're, we're as neutral and independent as possible on all these issues. But if you rotated it, my assumption would be that, th that that would not be something that would uh, um, kind of be uh, damaging for, for a candidate, for any means, so that Americans would be less likely to vote for a candidate because, because of their background like that. Can I just say one short thing? Yeah. So in this, like, how do we improve our message, the other thing that we haven't talked about is talking about the success of immigrants integrating. You know, most people, you ask them, do they learn speaking? You know, the biggest thing that bothers people is press two for English. You know, they right. think that they only can, no one's learning English. Um, they're not integrating. They're not becoming Americans. We don't do a nearly enough, good enough job about, about making that point that Phil said was, you know, the absolute gold standard, uncontrovertible, the kids learn English. Or how they're moving up in terms of, of socioeconomically and, and all kinds of ways. And I think... That's just part of the long-term education we've got to do to right. get around these cultural fears. They're not racial fears, they're cultural fears. I uh, have been really fascinated by the way multiple people on the panel have been talking about the beliefs that Americans have that are totally uh, contra reality, just not in tune with the way things actually are on this issue. And I've bumped into this over and over and over again um, myself, I, I constantly have uh, people ask me if I give a talk, um, how come the girls in your book don't go apply for legal status? I'm asked it all the time. So there's, there's a belief out there, and I'd say it's a majority of the people that I talk to, that undocumented workers or students, in, in my case students, can go change their legal status if they would just fill out some form, if they would just go see a lawyer, if they would just turn something in that they forgot to do. And I just wonder, to me, it seems like that's at the heart of the problem. That's why we can't pass reforms, because there's no popular understanding of what the problem actually is, that there's no way for these 11 million folks to go change their legal status with, with anything like, you know, what we would say is a reasonable investment of time or energy. And I was wondering if the pollsters could talk to that. Have you looked at it? Have you tried to examine what people's popular beliefs actually are? Like, I feel if you surveyed people... The majority of people in the United States would say, yes, those 11 million people could go change their status today if they wanted to. I feel like that's a belief that exists. It's just simply not true. I feel like there's a poll that could be written that would outline these false beliefs that would like map out really clearly what the public age education is that would have to happen. Does people, that not exist? People overestimate the number of foreign-born people in the country by two. They think there's twice as many as there are. They think there's seven times as many unauthorized ones as they are. I mean, basically, Americans think that a quarter of the population are unauthorized immigrants. I mean, it's only 11 million out of 311 million. <laughs> so, I mean, it starts with just the size of the problem. And yes, 
You see it over and over and over again in focus groups. You know, if they just went down to the post office and picked up their papers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot um, of packets waiting. For you. <laughs> the interesting though is 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 John Sides published a, a paper recently where he showed that if you correct yeah. people's misperception about the quantity, it doesn't actually change their views. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think I to an extent too. you can you can become overly focused on the misinformation yeah. that something on the level of, of values or, or something else is driving people's opinions and they kind of make up facts. To yeah. At the same time, I, I also feel that people um, have erroneous views in the other direction where there's this assumption that it's easy living for the undocumented. And that, that, that plays into the debates around the driver's licenses and why people want to kind of draw a line there. Um, and, and this notion of, that there's sort of great access to all this welfare. So it's interesting to hear you say that because I'm sure it's true that, people, that as if there's an act of defiance to remain undocumented, because hey, you can still avail yourself to all these goodies. I mean, that's kind of like the, maybe the misperceptions are all kind of wrapped two, up, Simon. Two quick points. One is that, look, the, the connection between the sociological other and the, you know, the racial other and welfare was the central tenet of a major political party in the United States for a generation, right? And this is not an accident that there is this sort of loose association, you know, that is being furthered by right-wing talk radio and right-wing shows. This was the central tenet of Republican domestic policy for two generations, right? So it's, there's a reason that is continuing to have resonance and power. And I think it's, because the thing that's incredible about this, and I've spoken about this and we've talked about this, the, the welfare argument is particularly offensive to Latinos because the highest worker participation rates of any slice of the American population is Latino immigrants, right? So it's, it's as untrue, it is more untrue for this audience than it is for, let's say, white, rural, older people who don't work anymore, right? It's much more true for that demographic, for the actual demographic that is incensed about this, right? The second point I want to make in getting back to sort of the challenges is that, you know, look, the, the other is the way that immigration is playing out in the U.S. right now. It's not universal. It's not happening in every community in the same way. Essentially, a huge percentage of the immigrants are moving into nine or ten states. And so the, cult, the cultures that are going through this change faster are represented by about 20 senators. Right? And the rest of the country is represented, the, the cultures that are not going through this degree of change are being represented by 80 senators. And it explains why you could have a situation where, you know, in every poll taken on the subject for years, you've got 55, 60, 65, 70 percent approval, and why you can't get it through the Senate because of the, de the demography of the way that immigration. So part of my conclusion of this is the, the, the way that America is changing and the population differential between, let's say, California and South Dakota which is 100 times different, right, is, was outside, I think, any conception that the Founding Fathers had about the way the country would develop. The Senate's become an anachronistic body that no longer is capable of actually governing the United States, given the way the demography of the country is playing out and the size differential between the big states and the little states, which was part of this original compromise, which just simply doesn't work anymore.